depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Will you pray with me this morning? Dear Jesus, we thank you for this celebration of a new year, God. But we thank you even more that you are the same God. That it is the same God that we put our hope in. That it is the same God who deserves all of the glory and all of the honor. And so I pray that as we do celebrate this new year, that we would not be quick to forget the hope that we have in you, Jesus, and the fact that there is still a hurting and broken world that needs to know you, God. And so we choose to move forward in confident trust, Lord. We choose to move forward with the hope that we have found in you. We choose to be bold, God. We choose to be the light that you've called us to be for your glory, and we will continue to proclaim that it is all from you and for you and to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
sing that one more time as a prayer this morning. Lord, this morning here at the first Sunday of the year, this is a song of prayer that we sing to you that you're worthy of it all. God, we know the things that have transpired in 2021, yet Paul says, forget not the former thing, press on to the thing that's in front of us. So Lord, here at the top of the year, 2022, we say that you're worthy of it all. And Lord, at the end of next year, we'll know a little bit more, but regardless of what it looks like or regardless of what happens, Lord, we are taking you into this new year with us. We are bringing you into this first worship service of the year. We open our ears to hear what you would have to say to us today. And I ask, Lord, as we pray and we believe every week, Lord, that we would be of encouragement one to another, that the body of Christ over the next couple moments, Lord, that we would come to life. I thank you, Lord, for each and every person that has come out today. I thank you for the people that are online today. And I pray that your blessing would rest upon this moment. I pray that it would rest upon our praise, Lord, as we give you what you deserve, Lord. We know that you've served up a meal for us. But right now we look to you and we pray, God, that our hearts would just be open that we would see how worthy you are, that our worth, God, would not be in us, but you living in us, Lord. You are worthy of all of our praise. And we lift you up and we champion God today. I pray that you would strengthen the believer today. I pray that you would save the unbeliever today. I thank you that your word says that you're the glory and the lifter of our head. And if our heart and our face is downcast, I pray that we would look up because your word says that our redemption draweth nigh. And I pray that you would bring help and healing to this house today. And I pray that we would, from the start of this new year, that we would capture this song and that it would live in our hearts. God, you're worthy of everything that happens this year and this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody shouted this morning, amen. Listen, can we take some time? Let's go about a minute and a half. Can we take some time to just greet some people in the room? Um, we can cross aisles today and sections today. It might be a while since you've seen somebody over on this part of the building. Take some time to communicate and talk. Encourage somebody today. Be a blessing to somebody today. Well, it got really, really quiet in here. <laughs> you know, it went from like um, like dinner at the kitchen table to uh, library, just, just like that. Um, who's thankful for a new year that the Lord has given you? Um, you know, when I was thinking about it this morning, driving in, I think that would always be our hope that we get to step over the threshold into a new year, 2021 20, is over, and we get to step out into 
2022, yet we're also mindful that that's not everybody's reality. Paul said to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord, and I, I don't know that time that the Lord's going to allow my last breath to be taken here, but I will say this, every year until that happens, I'm hopeful that I'm going to be able to walk into another one and that the Lord is going to be with me and that he is going to go before me. Who believes this morning sitting here on the first Sunday of the month of the new year that 2022 is going to be a good year, that God is going to be with us and he's going to be faithful? There's a couple of announcements that I do want to make today. First of all, if you're a guest with us or first or second time guest with us today, you received one of these cards when you came in. If you'll take just a few moments and fill out any information on there that you would be comfortable uh, giving us, that would be appreciated. Maybe you're watching online today and you would like to find out more about Merrimack Heights Church, just private message us and uh, we'll have some individuals send out some information that will help you know a little bit more about what we do here in this community and what we do as a local church. So on the back side of that, I'm, I'm going to ask the entire church to have really big ears right now, okay? And I want you to understand something. And sometimes we do things every week, but it might not always convert. We might be listening to something else or thinking about lunch during this time. Every week, we talk to you all about writing down your prayer needs. Now, this is a scriptural thing that we're to take on one another's burdens, and the Bible says that as we do that, we fulfill the law of Christ. Yet some of you could be sitting here, and you might be thinking, well, we don't want to burden a group of people to pray for us. Well, let me just tell you that's anti-scriptural, because that's what we're supposed to be doing. So if you are believing for a family member to get saved, or you have a sick loved one in your life, or you're walking through a financial time, or or your, your mind and heart needs healing, it could be a plethora of stuff, because we got a lot of people that are part of the church here, but we want you to discipline yourself, if you will, in 2022, just to take a moment, and if you need prayer in your life, in your family, each week, just jot something down. I don't even care if you put, I need prayer again. We will pray over those things, and we'll lift you up before the Lord. We don't want you to be going through things alone, and we do know that we're not uh, walking shoulder to shoulder with everybody throughout the week. But if you will communicate to us how we can pray for you coming into this new year, we would love to take the time to do that. Who's thankful that you have some people that that want to pray for you, and we're doing everything that we can to to facilitate that? So fill that out today, and you could just put it in the black boxes as you leave. Uh, Another thing that I want you to be aware of today is that we have purple books ready to go. They're at both exits today as you're leaving the building We are asking you not to just grab a handful and get out the door. Um, We're going to have a couple people to facilitate that today, and it's just going to be as simple as um, saying, hey, I want two books for the kitchen family or however many that we have, party of five, you know, and and we're going to ask you to just check in with the person back there so that we can log how many books are going out. I wanted to give a a little bit of, uh, uh, of boundary in that. We are not just offering these to the entire community at large. What we have done is we have purchased more than enough for individuals in our church because this year we are focusing on discipleship, taking the journey, and we are believing a year from now. I want you to, in your mind, think a year from now. We are believing that you're not going to be the only one that's sitting here as a family, but that your family is going to impact people. I believe your family might fill a whole row or a whole whole section this year that God is going to move in a powerful way. So today, as we're leaving service, these books are going to work in tandem on what we are speaking on on Sunday morning. It's not going to be an exact duplicate of that message but they're going to be working in tandem. Even what I'm preaching about today, you're going to have some homework between now and Sunday of next week. So we want you to grab a book today at an exit. We'll have individuals that are back here helping you out. Just let us know, hey, I need one for Brian, need one for Joy, need one for Ty, need one for Nora, need one for Brianna. And we'll fill that out and we will give you a book and you walk out with us. More to come on that. I'll be talking about that in in just a few moments. The other thing that I'm really excited about today is we are walking into a new year, and I will say this happened pretty quickly, and the decision was pretty quickly made 
that there are already people today that need the resource. So instead of postponing it another month, we have trained six people to actually start a new ministry that Merrimack Heights Church is launching today. I think we have some pictures in the back. At 3 p.m. today, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., Merrimack Heights Assembly of God Church will be passing out food to our community right up here. Where's it at? Right over here at Merrimack Heights Elementary School. We are very excited about that. This program does have some parameters. So the the individuals that we are authorized to give food out to would be individuals that have children living in their home three years to 18 years old. These are all uh, uh, foods that are approved by the state. We are giving seven, seven suppers, seven snacks, and a gallon of milk per child for children that are living in an individual's home ages three to 18 years old. We are thankful that the Lord has opened this opportunity, and we are also thankful that he allowed it to happen today. We are asking you to pray for that team, because I think it's going to be in the 20s and 30s as they are serving together, but who knows, the warmth of the Holy Spirit will keep them alive. And we have posted some things online. You're like, Pastor, how can I help? How can I help? I think as of this morning, we had about 14 people that had shared that. If you want to help us give food to individuals in the community, look at that Facebook post that we made, share it out to the community so that they could see it, and we are believing to, um, we're believing to serve 150 families today um, on the Merrimack Heights Elementary School campus. We're so thankful for the relationship that we've had over the years with them. We're so thankful that God opens doors for us. Who's thankful that we can launch that today and that with God's help, we're going to help a lot of people over this next year? I don't want to belabor that or spend too much time on that, but As I said, we have a team of six people that are trained to help. Uh, The training takes about 10 minutes for an individual like yourself to walk through. We are not going to need help through the month of January, but as we are preaching through discipleship this year, our heart and hope is that 100% of the people that call Merrimack Heights Church their home, that they would show up on one of the Sundays and donate an hour or two hours of their time and look people in the eyes and pass out food to them and we're asking you over the next year to be a part of that. So more to come on that, but, but we're thankful for what the Lord is going to continue to do uh, through that. Um, I, I'm not going to share this in, in a live format. This will happen in detail in our annual business meeting at the end of February for the members of Merrimack Heights Church. But I am going to tell you this. God has done exceedingly and abundantly what we could ever ask or think at a financial level here at Merrimack Heights in 2021. Can you lift up the Lord for that this morning? <clears throat> it's it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like when you walk through processes and you have a heart and you're believing God to do things, but yet when you really see those numbers and they come in and you're closing out a year, it's kind of like, God, you did what type thing? Now, I want to remind you, this does not just happen. And you might say, well, pastor, that means we can let off this year. Nope, because we have a vision to help more people than we've ever helped before. And I am simply asking you again this year to be obedient and to be a biblical giver here at Merrimack Heights Church. And we believe that each year we'll have pressed down, shaken together, running over, that monies will come in so that we can touch and help and impact other people. So I want to encourage you from the top of the year to be faithful with your tithe and offering here at Merrimack Heights Church. We've got black boxes at the door there that you could give on your way out. You can also give online at merrimackheightschurch.com. And then we also have a P.O. box that you can give to at 12 o- P.O. box 1205 Arnold, Missouri, 63010. So I want to say thank you for your generosity. We're looking forward to what the Lord will do in 2022. Who wants to be blessed more in 2022 so that you can give more to the kingdom of God? You know, that's a a question I want to ask. Sometimes we want to be blessed more so that we can have more. And and I think that's part of our fleshly desire. Hey, if I get blessed more, I can have a little bit of stuff. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I do believe that we should continue to follow a biblical formula and pattern in our giving. And I believe that when we do, we see the Lord take care of us. Not always in financial ways, in a lot of different ways. But uh, he'll show up 
in amazing ways in our life. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me this morning. I want to pray over this service, pray that our hearts would be open. Would you, would you lift your voices and pray with me as I pray for myself to share this? Lord, I pray here for your word. This is a very important part of what we do. Your word have we hidden in our heart that we might not sin against you. And Lord, as we are stepping out into this one-year series, as we are embarking to go on a journey of taking the journey together, Lord, with the wonderful church that you have blessed us with, God, with this group of people that you have allowed us to serve with, we are praying for an incredible year, for a harvest, Lord, that we would be shocked by. We are praying that at the end of this year, we would be full-fledged followers of Jesus Christ. We are believing that on week one, God, I pray as pastor of this church, not four weeks of warm-up or not first quarter, I am praying on week one for a Holy Spirit-inspired message to hit the heart of those that are here, Lord, that as we are walking through this journey together this year, I pray that it would be the most fruitful year that we have ever experienced as a local church as we move into a new glory of what you have for us. So, Lord, I ask for you to take everything that would distract us, everything, Lord, that would cause our mind to go somewhere else. I pray from our young people to our older people that our ears would be listened. Anything that would interrupt the hearing of the word today, I pray that it would be minimized and that the gospel message would go forward here in this this church here in this moment, not only in this service, but online as well, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everyone shouted this morning, amen. I'm inviting you this year, and when I say I, that would be much beyond me. That would be our church staff, our church team. Um, We're bringing you into this as well as the Lord has been speaking into our hearts. I'm inviting you to take the journey. Everybody shout, take the journey. If you're watching online, you could just comment right now in the comments, take the journey, because usually at the top of the year, I would be speaking vision. I would be speaking visionary components of where we're going and what the Lord is saying, and I want you to know that the vision of 2020 for Merrimack Heights Church is that 100% of this local church would take the journey with us right alongside of us. And I've subtitled it, I believe that we have a graphic today, I've subtitled it, Not Hardly. Take the journey, not hardly. Shout not hardly back to me. Have you ever been talking to someone and you're sharing with them and you're talking and communicating with them and they go and share what you've told to somebody else and somebody else comes back to you and and you get wind of what they said that you said And the person says, so is that what you said? And you're like, not hardly. That's not even close to what I said. Have you ever had that happen before? How many of you in the room have kids? You ever had that happen before? What about the game telephone? Does anybody remember the game telephone? Um, For for all my my people here that grew up in the late 70s and 80s, it might have been prior to, but we played this game called telephone. And what it looked like was this. Let's imagine that we had a line here of 20 people. And all of a sudden, I had a thought. We would do this in children's ministry too. But I had a thought, and I would whisper it to the next person. The second person would whisper it to the third person, the third to the fourth. The 19th person would whisper it to the 20th person. And all of a sudden, what would happen? The 20th person would tell the room what the first person said. And all of a sudden, I mean, every time I played the game, all of a sudden, they would unfold the riddle or they would unfold what was said. And the guy in the back is like, is that what you said? And it's like, not hardly. That's not even close to what I was communicating because things get lost second, third, fourth hand. And we've seen that happen in the natural. And I want to share some things with you around this not hardly theme. I want you to be thinking about that telephone game if you ever played it as we navigate scripture. Again, we are inviting you to take the journey of discipleship 
with us. And we believe that as a local church, at the end of 2022, everyone who will submit themselves to the word of God and what he has given us to teach and preach on, we believe that every single one of us will be a believer that has grown up more in the faith as we embark in transitioning into 2023 one year from now. Who's ready for that? Anybody in the church ready for that? So the goal this year is discipleship. Discipleship is growing in Christ. And, and what I have found in this is this. I found that even in kids' ministry when I was young, we sang songs about there, there were the disciples and this is what they did. And we had all of the color pages and all of that kind of stuff. But I find the more that we live we like hearing the stories about the disciples. We like seeing where they fit in, in biblical concept. We like seeing where they fit in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But as far as living out disciple lives for Jesus Christ, where the word of God is alive in us, and we are reaching people, reaching regions, reaching nations, I find we're a little bit few and far between believers that are really living this out. I'm not talking about great Bible study. I'm not even talking about memorizing passages of scripture or being qualified to teach on it. I'm talking about on a daily basis, ministering to the needs of people. And I don't know about you, but I believe that's why God allowed us to be a church on this planet to minister to the lives of people. What I find, this is me now, what I find in the tension of the word discipleship lives this word discipline. Everybody say discipline. Who loves discipline? We were driving through Culver's um, yesterday evening, and Brianna, I'll, I'll preach one weekend on my drive through routine, because um, trust me, it's spiritual. And, and I'll teach a little bit on that. But we're driving through Culver's, and Brianna is taking the list. So really, my only rule in the drive through is this. Usually, we're ordering for five to seven to eight people. It depends on who's over or what we're doing. I have This is my deal. Just tell me what you want and don't change it. I, I, if, if you don't want pickles on it, that's fine. I'll order it that way. But don't then say, oh, no, I've, I decided I wanted onion. No, forget that stuff. Just what you say is what you get. And that's how my dad was, and I inherited that. So here's the deal. I told, uh, Joy had sent me a text, so what are we going to do for dinner? Uh, burger sounded good, so she said, Let, let's do Culver's. So I told Brianna, she's with her phone, I'm like, just make a list of what everybody wants. Ty was in the car, Brianna was in the car, Nora was in the car. Joy texted in her order. And as Nora, or Brianna, is taking the order, she asked me what I wanted, and I'm like, well, I just want a single with everything, fries, and a Coke. She's riding in the front, and all of a sudden, I feel her hand squeezing my shoulder, and she said, Dad, let me help you. And I said, well, what? She said, you wanted to stop drinking Coke. So she said, what do you want? She made me order something else on the menu. <laughs> what is that? Discipleship. Discipline. Got a friend, pastor friend that says this. Lives easy, preaches hard. Or preaches easy, lives hard. Let me get that right. A lot of us love to hear about the disciples. We love to hear about churches reaching communities. We love to hear about the house filled with people. But the work and the discipline and the effort to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, my friend, is costly. It is not easy. There are moments of pain. It, it is not just a road that you're walking down, tiptoeing through the tulips. Trials come. Adversaries come. Persecution comes. To really be discipled takes some effort. And I find that living in the word discipleship is the word discipline. And to be a disciple, it means that I need to have some healthy routines spiritually that are built into my life. That's the first part of discipleship, healthy routines. The second part of discipleship or discipline is this, I need to be disciplined. Now, how many of you growing up loved it when your parents disciplined you? You just couldn't wait till dad came home. I don't, know if, I don't know how it worked with you all, but if my mom had to call my dad at the church office because I was acting up 
and I was not being disobedient to her, and she walked in and said, Dad said he'll deal with it when he gets home, it was a miserable four to five to six hours. Because when my dad was coming home, my dad was coming home to chastise. We've lost it today. When my dad was coming home, my dad was coming home to discipline. I am not talking about unhealthy discipline. I am talking about spiritual discipline that knows that you have been disciplined and that you know that you have been chastised because somebody sees the path that you're walking on will cause you to live in despair and death and they will rescue you. That's what discipline is, spiritual discipline. If God loves you in 2022, he has to chastise you. If you are a son and daughter of God, don't walk through these moments and say, oh, God's never chastising me because I don't do anything wrong. Look for the areas of your life that he's causing you and calling you to grow up in. Some other things when it comes to the struggle of discipline for those that are human, and that would be most people in the room except for this guy behind me, it would be this that as I'm committing to these processes that are going to grow me in Christ, it might mean that I might have to say, you know what, I've never really had these things down. Or I started for a month, or maybe I gave a good year run, but there are things in my life. Think about it. How are we ever going to be everything that God calls us to be if we're not taking time to pray, taking time to read the Word, taking time to memorize the Word, and taking time to implement what we've memorized into our life. Now, I don't say that to downgrade anybody. I say that rather at the beginning of the year. Imagine what would happen if we would wake up to that and say, this is going to be a year that I walk with God in a new way. So committing to the process can be difficult for humans, and then committing to being corrected. Let me, let me just ask you, what corrects us in the spirit realm? What corrects us? Well, it starts with the Word of God. The Word of God brings correction. But if I'm never in the Word of God, then how can it correct me? So when I get in the Word of God and I begin to read the Word of God and I say, Lord, open my heart to this reading today, as I'm reading in that, maybe you're doing the Bible through in a year, as I'm reading in the book of beginnings, what do you want to show me from the life of Adam and Eve? What do you want to show me from the life of Noah, Moses, Sarah? We go all the way through Scripture. What, what, what it is, it, is it in their life and their patterns, Lord, that might be in my pattern that you want to tweak and change in 2022? So part of that is being corrected. How will he do that? Well, he will do that with the word, and then he will do that with spiritual leaders in your life. You say, well, pastor, is that part of your responsibility? Well, it's part of my role. Well, how do you correct? I teach the word of God. The word of God exposes an area of your life that you need help in. You begin to reach out to people. That might be me. That might be somebody else. You might say, yeah, yeah pastor, so-and-so is praying me through this, helping me through this. But, the, but there's an area of your life that's, that's off path, and you got to get back on track. Who had one area in your life in 2021 that was off track, and God had to help you get back on track in 2021? Just show of hands real quick. Could have been simple. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand again, because I know you've all been redeemed coming into 2022. But I want to ask you this question. Raise a hand in your heart. Have you carried any of those patterns that the Lord was dealing with that you did not master yet with his help into 2022? Are you already in 2022 and the Lord was trying to get you to come up the mountain, but you stayed at base camp? That's what we're talking about here really over the next month. Now, I know what you're thinking when I begin to say, hey, we're going to be in this entire series for a year. You might be saying a whole year of discipleship, but if you'll give me a moment, I'd like to counter that. Because isn't the goal for us to live every day discipled in the things of God? Wouldn't a one-year investment to be discipled possibly in ways that I never have to open my heart to some things, some areas of healing and deliverance that need to happen that I've been carrying too long to be able? This is another hope that I have. I hope that this year in 2022, 100% of the people lead somebody to Christ here at Merrimack Heights Church, not in this building, but that that would come off some of us. I've had so many conversations, but pastor, it's God that saves people. Absolutely, but how does he oftentimes do that? Through a vessel. You'll never save someone 
But my friend, you should be leading someone through the sinner's prayer Will they say, in Jesus' name, amen. And in that moment, God saved them. In the park, at the, at the place that you're getting the, the, the car worked on, at a, at a drive through I don't know what it would look like. Places that you frequent often, you're building relationships with them. I'm not just building relationships haphazardly, Lord. You brought people into my life, and if they don't know you, I can't keep walking by their side and walking with them, having never asked them where they are with the Lord. So that's discipline. It's, it's correcting bad behavior even in our own life to think years and decades can go by, but, but we're not really expanding the gospel by telling friends and neighbors and family members that are without Christ the greatest hope that we have. It, it's committing to a process. And, and when I look at this year-long perspective, my thought is, well, Brian, every minute of your life, God never lets you off the hook on this. So we have to walk through it and we have to learn from it. We have to discipline ourselves, and to do this effectively, we can't do this outside of Scripture. Scripture has to drive the engine. So I want to share a Scripture with you found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, and it says this, and it's the Word of God, so this is the same for all of us. This is the same for all of us. It's not easier for some. When you have an area of your life that is out of discipline and God's working with you, it's just as hard for you as it is for everybody else. So it's very easy for us to begin to say, well, look how quickly they grow. Well, they might have got over it a little bit more quickly because they allowed and yielded themselves to God's strength to help them, but it was just as painful for them as it was for you because God was working them through something. Hebrews 12, 11 says this. Now, no chastening. I can put in parentheses there and it will not change the, the English, discipline. Now, no change, chastening or discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but what, church? What, say it a little bit louder. But painful. So there's a semicolon put there. They don't stop. Scripture says, nevertheless, so this is after the pain, post-pain. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, I do know this in my own life. It doesn't matter what I've let carry over year after year after year. Until I deal with it with God's help, I'm not gonna be at peace. You can dress it up on Sunday morning and make it look like you're, you're at peace. You, man, you could be in the band and make it look like you're at, pre, uh, at peace or on the media team or serve team or passing out food today or preach the message and make it look like you're at peace. But if God is kind of riding a nerve in your life and saying, I, I wanna deal with this with you and you will not allow him, there is not full levels of peace in your life. This says it will be painful Yet after the pain, it will yield fruit. Well, what will the fruit yield like? Well, it, it will be a fruit of righteousness to the person who has been trained by it. Now, now I can't use myself as this example, but if we brought up uh, an incredibly fit individual today, and, and I mean they just had an, an impeccable eating routine and, um, and, and cardio routine and lifting routine, I couldn't be that example um, I might try to dress to look like I'm that example, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not that example. That athlete or that person, and, and there's some people that I've followed over time, and I'm just, by, by, their, by their discipline as a, of an athlete, I won't say their names today, but it's just, I'm, I'm mesmerized by it. All of a sudden, you start talking to them about their food routines, their cardio routines, their lifting routines, what they give up, how early they get up, what their sleep routines, the money they spend. Like, wow. Well, it was painful to get there, but now that they've been trained by it, I could tell you right now, they feel a lot better than this guy, right? So even as we're coming into the new year, there might be some things in our life that we're like, God, even at a physical level, I need to dial some of these things in, but pain is the process oftentimes. Now, I am not, I am not giving you this message that, 2022 is going to be this year of painfully pursuing Jesus. That would be kind of a hard visionary message to come out of the gate with. 
Guys, 2022, let me just say what the vision for the church is, for us to walk through a ton of pain. Now listen to this. Nor am I removing from the equation that as the Lord begins to deal with some deep-seated things in you, as the Lord begins to deal with some things you didn't even call sin, and through discipleship brings it to the surface, and you look at it, and God says, no, that's the sin I've been trying to get you to deal with for three years or three decades. If you will yield yourself to the processes of God and the processes of the word and go through the pain, then the end result will be the righteous fruit being lived out in your life by the person being trained by it. I don't know about you, but I want God to have a trained church at the end of 2022. That there are some areas of maturity that have to to, to wake up in us and us become all who Christ is has called us to be. So I'm not suggesting it's going to be a painful year, but nor am I minimizing the fact that when God begins to deal with areas of your life that you need to change, don't run from the pain if it's going to be painful. Does everybody hear me this morning? Let's just navigate that with God. Somebody shout, take the journey, not hardly. Now, I want to, I want to throw this idea out this morning. Imagine that one day, and I think it would be sad, to be standing before God, having just simply listened to what others said about God. I call it, for starters, at least a secondhand revelation. I am up here preaching this message today. I am being diligent, study to show yourself approved. I I don't know of anything that I haven't done. I have prayed over it. I have worked through it. I always say, Lord, I'm preaching it to you first. Do you want me to change anything? I have done everything, but here's the deal. It is a secondhand revelation to you. When you take the oracles of Scripture and you take the Word of God and you open it and you say, God, Pastor Brian was speaking on this, I believe a remarkable thing will happen. I believe in your life he can take you deeper than what I ever could because God now speaks to you firsthand. The only thing that I can do is charge. The only thing that I can do is speak. The only thing that I can do under the inspiration of God is to preach so that it would wake something up in you under the power of the Spirit to say, Lord, I want to live this life clean for you. I want to live this year disciple for you. I want to see my life become everything that you have caused it to become. We can't just take what everybody else is saying about God and call it truth. I was having a conversation with one of my kids not too long ago, and we were talking about a a certain theological concept. And the certain theological concept was way off in left field, but it looked pristine on YouTube. And I've said this several times, but I'm going to continue to say it. Every time we just have something that has visual presentation that looks good does not make it truth. And I'm not saying to go out and start looking for this, but it saddens and crushes my heart that we have churches in this country that families go to that are sizable churches. Everything from the outside would look amazing. The facilities, the stuff that they have, but they are teaching and preaching that there there is no literal hell. That hell is a place It is an idea on earth that we will walk through some of it in this this earth. But, But really, at the end, everybody goes to heaven. Jesus died for everyone's sin. Folks, that's false. That is not the right teaching. That is not Bible. I would even say at a theological level, when kids are like, man, I listened to a message. It moved me. It was awesome. I would listen to it. I would research the doctrine of the church, the scripture, the teaching, more and more we are seeing it. And it's not always boldly preached from the platform, but when you comb through the, the, the religious side of it, the, the statement of faith, and you begin to see this, it, it is destructive and it is wrong. And if you don't mind me just saying it what it is today, it's sinful. It's sinful to teach. It's dangerous to teach any other gospel than the gospel is, that is the legitimate God-breathed word of God. 
And if there's anything that I would do as a parent to get your kids well studied in, it would not be nine master's degrees in the age that we live in. It would not be just going out and finding something to do that would make a pretty good living to be able to make some money to have a house and pay it off early. That would not be it. I would show them that the best thing that they can study and be well studied in is the word of God, to study it, to pray it, to live it, to breathe it, to eat it, to, 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 to live it out, the word of God. So it would, be, it would be awful to stand before the Lord having listened to this. Imagine a person who was never taught correctly and they just listened to what every so-called teacher or preacher said. Imagine to be standing before God and be saying, well, well Lord, that is what sin was, correct? And the Lord, I know it's just my message title, but the title, but the Lord would look at them and say, hardly not. Hard, hardly not. No, no, that's not what it was. What my word says is what it is and what it was. And it also is what is to come. Because the word, church, is not just the physical word of God. The word becoming flesh is Christ. It was God that breathed through men to write down the Bible. We have to, for our family's sake, stop wiggling out of things that are sinful, that are not right. It's, it's probably, I, I would have to spend some time thinking about it, but it's probably one of the greatest things that I appreciate about my parents is they were not afraid to call sin, sin. They didn't call it our little issue, our little thing that we were dealing with. It's if you got stuff that the enemy's trying to take you out with, we're taking that thing to prayer, fasting and prayer, and a lot of anointing oil. It didn't matter in my house if you needed oil. Dad didn't run over to the church. You just walked in the kitchen, found some cooking oil, whatever. Pray in the name of Jesus. Pray that they'd be healed, restored, built up. We, we, discipline, the discipline. In this world, it's hard because we look at what, I'm going to say this, what a majority of parents are doing, they are teaching out of a culture that is a subculture to the Word of God, thinking that it will benefit and help their kids, and it won't in the end. It won't. Sin is sin, is sin, is sin. And it would be, it, it would be, it would be hurtful to stand before the Lord to think that I bought into a culture I bought into a culture that did not rightly divide Scripture, Lord, and I never really consulted you. That's why we're always going to be big on you studying the Word of God for your own. Imagine for God to say not hardly. As a matter of fact, for us, and we're going to do this, for us as a church to really understand sin and salvation, we really have to go back to the beginning of the Bible. And it's something that so many of us have done but we haven't always done a correct cross-reference and like working through it. In other words, it was a cute story of Adam and Eve and the little apple that they drew, but how does it really apply to me? Well, we're gonna show you from God's word how it does. The original plan of God for mankind was that you and I would have a relationship with God. Would you agree with this? Your relationship with God is way more important than your relationship with your husband or wife. Would you agree with this? Your relationship with God is more important than your relationship with your kids, with your community, with your church, with your workplace. Yet sometimes we will spend tons of hours with our spouse, tons of hours with our kids, even in building a relationship, tons of hours at work, and God's like, where's the relationship here? It takes discipline, men at Merrimack Heights Church. It takes discipline. It takes effort. I know you'll get up at 5.30, 5 o'clock in the morning to do some things, but what about the word of God? What about this year being your year where you say, this is going to be a year that I grow in God? What if men in our church would take on the 12 challenges that will be issued, and by the end of the year, you will actually have memorized portions of scripture. I'm not saying all of our guys. I'm challenging some guys. What if some women in our church this year would stop downplaying some of the little jabs and the little things that you do, things that might be coming out of our mouth that the word would register as gossip? 
What would happen if this year, those little things that are taking your time, even if it's your home or whatever, and saying, Lord, that's robbing all my time. I haven't been building a relationship with you. What if our youth knew what sin really was? And what if our youth would rise to a different standard that every time I rise up over the authority structure in my home of those parents that God have given me, I have sinned against God. God cannot bless it. He will not bless it. And the word says his promise is not attached to me, which is long life. What would happen if we would call it what it is? Disobedience in the home. What would happen if that was uprooted and in 2022, you would walk into February and March with your kid not just saying, yes, sir, What would happen if your kid would walk in and say, I've been disobedient, I haven't been honoring you, I haven't been listening to you, I've been listening and living my own way. Real discipline, hard, painful stuff, yet for the person who will endure and walk through it, the fruit of righteousness will be attached to them. I don't know about you, but I want the fruit of righteousness all over me this year as I buffet my body, Paul said, and beat that thing into submission. It's not always easy. So let me say it this way. You'll know the scripture. God created man in his image through the original plan and the original story. This is inherent it through nine people. God created man in his likeness to have dominion. Did you know that you were put on this planet to have dominion? What, well, what do you have dominion over? Because what happens is we'll lose our dominion over the thing that we will not... Um, that we will not apply scriptural boundaries to. So dominion over the family, with dominion over, over the, and, and this is all within the degrees of love from scripture. Let me read this, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. You'll know this well. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. I love it because everybody that we're looking at, I mean, look at somebody sitting next to you. Did you know they were made in the image of God? I, I mean, I know you know it because you read the verse. But do you know you have no right to make a comment on someone else, what they look like, because they were made in the image of God? And do you know when you minimize somebody else, however however you think they should have been built, that God built them and manufactured them and made them in their mother's womb and had a heart for them? So do you know when you... When, when, you, when you look down on humanity, you are actually looking down on the divine? Because I was created in his image. Do you know, I've got to say this because the Holy Spirit just hit me with this. Do you know when you look in the mirror and you start looking at all your little flaws there and start spending all this time, I've got to this and I've got to that and I've got to look better here and I, God knows I've got to work out 15 hours a week to get this thing. Do you know when you begin to minimize what you're looking at in the mirror, that you are downplaying God because you are built in his image. Some of us need to look in the mirror and say, I'm handsome because God created me. I'm beautiful because God created me. Now, does this mean that there's not gonna be things that we don't work on? No, we'll work on some things, but the root is this. I was made in the image of God. It says in Genesis, according to our likeness, let them have dominion, dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over all the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Then he'll remind us, in the image of God, he created him. So you can't miss it right here. What did he create? He created male and female. And I want to remind you this morning, standing on this pulpit, both of them have two completely different functions. God has built them the way that he's built them in his image. He has built them by design. What we know the scripture, he creates Adam and he reaches down into Adam's chest cavity and he pulls a rib out. And she wasn't man, she was whoa, man. That's what Adam thought when he saw her. He's like, I mean, you did a good deal with me, God, creating me in your image, but that right there, Lord, that's what I'm after, and vice versa. God has genuinely put within us a desire for the other kind. And the enemy will always, has always perverted truth. He will try to flop it up on its back. Here's the reality. God made us for a reason 
the way that he made us for a reason. Men be the men that you are called to be. Women be the women that you are called to be so that God would be honored and glorified and in the midst of struggle and turmoil and sin, submit it to God and watch your life go to a whole nother level in him. That's with anything in our life. It says that he created him man or male and female, he created them. So when we look at this, this scripture, it's, it's the beginning, and I'm not teaching this whole concept, but it gives man's position. Man's original position was to be created to bring glory and honor to God. If I want a strong foundation, I need to build on what, church? I need to build on the word of God. There is not a man in this building that if you went to look at a house and they started talking to you about the house and the house was absolutely beautiful and they would say, you know what? The foundation is jacked. It's got cracks all over it. We don't, it's settling. We, we don't even, honestly, we don't even know the house will be here in five years. You wouldn't be like, well, babe, at least we could get four good years out of it. No. Yeah, yeah, we kind of made the, yeah, we kind of, we didn't put any rebar in the, in the concrete there. It's, it's just kind of, I think, the, I think when they mixed it, I think they put more sand in it than they were supposed to. I mean, it's awful. Foundation is awful. Rest of the house, gorgeous. Heated floors. You would not buy the house. Because, number one, you wouldn't feel safe to put your family in it. You wouldn't feel safe to have Christmas. It's like, what's going to happen? I think we're already here at Creaking. Why? Because it's foundational stuff. Why would you build a foundation on anything else other than the rock and the word of God because there's no safety in it? Why would you water down and minimize stuff to make yourself feel comfortable with a certain part of scripture, sir, when God said, no, I'm not letting you off the hook. What I said is what I meant. Ma'am, why would you kind of wiggle around and say, oh, we can, we can cut corners there. You can't cut corners with the foundation. You can cut corners with countertops, not with the foundation. The foundation is the most important thing. I want to ask you a serious question. Do you really want to be men that build on a foundation of Jesus Christ in 2022? Do you really want to sit here 53 more weeks, not off, and be like, yeah, that's kind of cool for my wife, but I don't know if I'm getting anything. Do you want to open your heart and say, I am lacking in discipleship? There are areas of my life that I could be so further along in if I would just open my heart to brothers and sisters in Christ, open my heart to the word. I really believe that everyone who will do that, Joy and I are gonna work through that ourselves. I believe God has a solid year planned for us. God puts us, or put him in the garden. He says, now take dominion. It's, it's the original story. It's build a strong foundation on what the word of God tells us to do. Now, I want to go to Genesis 2, 15 through 17. I think we have these verses for you. Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. I want you to take really quick note here that God does not give them a hundred things that they cannot do. And at this point in the original story, we're not even into the Ten Commandments yet. God just said, here's the deal. Don't eat from this specific tree and you tell me what man did. All of us know, it's just like, do we say it? Because we've done it too. Like, do we say it? We can't just put this on Adam and Eve. They ate from the tree. Have you ever seen those posts that says, he had one job? You ever seen those before? And you're sitting there and you're thinking, what in the world? I mean, this guy knew. If he would have just done the one job, everything else would have been fine. You had one job. It could be somebody all of a sudden you see a, a video camera and they're breaking it and stealing a car. And on that video camera, you see the guard that's just sitting here sleeping like this. He had one job, stay awake on your shift. But now the, the fleet of cars are gone. Sometimes I just wonder, like from back from the beginning, if that's not 
the derivative of those posts. Adam and Eve had one job. Church, you had one job. And that one thing, or consistently those one things that God's saying, hands off, you want to touch. That one thing that God is saying, stay away from. You you want to, over time, be a part of. And I want to show you through a, a, a discipleship pattern today why your life is the same as my life, although we fall for a lot of different things. Why, when God says no, do we want to head in that direction? Because Scripture really points it out to us. It's not 100 things that he asked. It wasn't 10 things. It's just like, hey, do this. Do, stay away from this tree, but eat from this tree. Sin, I wanted to make it as simple as I could and still keep the, the essence of what sin is because I could give you a statement from commentaries and study that would sound really, really good when it comes to sin, and you'd be like, oh, okay. But here's what sin really is. Sin is disobedience to God. We are going to talk this month about sin, and we're going to talk about salvation all month long. Sin is disobedience to God. Don't look at a well-written statement from your favorite author on what sin is. I want to give you a very simple deal. Sin is disobedient for God. If you were disobedient to the Lord in the last seven days when he asked you to do something, sin of omission or commission, a sin of omission is, is, is a sin that you wrote out. God said it, but you're like, forget that, I'm doing it anyway. Or, or God said it, you didn't really think about it, you just didn't follow through it. It's, that's an omitted sin. A committed sin, sin of commission, is something God said didn't do, but you committed the act against God because it was disobedience to God. So a lot of times we really fish or we're looking for or we get surprised by what I call the, the, the big sins, but we got a lot of little ones living in our life, sins of commission and omission because we didn't do what God asked us to do. God said, be faithful, be obedient, obey me, but we didn't. So we had one job and who by a show of hands can fail that sometimes you fail at your one job or your one responsibility that God had. So I wanted to say this, sin, any act of sin, I'm not going to categorize them, is disobedience to God. Sir, sin is not a little slip up in your life. Ma'am, sin is not just this little minor error that I have in my life. Youth, sin is not college age students, sin is just not kind of this little issue. It's really not that big of a deal. No, sin is sin. And I think you would agree with me. If so, just shout back at me. Sin is a big deal to God. Sin of all sorts. Little, huge, however you want to classify it. A lot of us will look at the huge sin of someone else and we'll have a hundred little sins in our life. I'm going to tell you right, if all those would get together, it'd be a pretty big sin. And we start rating stuff without just simply looking at Scripture and saying, wait a minute, Lord, were you asking me to do anything this week that I just shrugged it off and said no? Have you simply been prompting me to do things and to move in the direction of obedience to you, but I've been saying no? For Lord, if I have, I've got some sin in my life that needs to be brought to the altar of God where man meets God, not just this altar, and it needs to be dealt with. James chapter 1, 12 through 15 says this, blessed or blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord promised to those who loved him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings death. That's James 1, 12 through 15. Now, you might be wondering what this is. Did anybody wonder what this big stuffed teddy bear was behind me? 
Well, I want to, for the next few weeks, introduce you to a friend of mine who I'm sure has been a friend of yours at times. It's not a friend we like to bring to the forefront of our life. It's not a friend that we for sure like to bring to church. It's not a friend that we like to have at the family Christmas party, possibly particularly in front of your kids. But it is something that we all deal with. This is my friend, sin. You have a friend, sin. It's not flashing on the screen today. You don't journal about it so much can see it. It might be suppressed. It might be small. It might be hiding under the spiritual carpet in the corner of your room. But who would agree that sin is sin is sin and it needs to be dealt with in our life? So when we look at this, I mean, for most, who would, who would agree that this thing is cute or has a level of it? It's actually supposed to sit in the sunshine for 12 hours so it gets fatter and puffier. We haven't had any sun, so it's a, he's a little malnourished right now. But when I look at sin, it's cute. When I look at sin, it's nice. When I look at sin, it's, it's comfortable. When I look at sin, it, it feels good. I mean, if we were to be honest, it's pretty much absolutely adorable because that's the hook. That's how the enemy reels you and I in. And I want to remind you and preach this from the word of God. The devil did not make you do it. The process of every sin in your life was just outlined in the scripture that we read. How can something so nice and, and attractive and cuddly and so soft be so destructive? Well, my friend, sin is sitting dormant right now on this Sunday. You're not running around with it. You might go back to it later this evening or sometime on Wednesday morning, but right now we're appearing to be pretty attentive to what's going on. But I'm gonna tell you the innards of this thing is a grizzly bear. It's not cute in your life and it will destroy you. And I'm trying to preach to somebody at the beginning of 2022 who has allowed something to carry over from 2021. God has given you a moment. He's casting a net for you to deal with something in your life with his love and with his mercy and with his help to say, Lord, let that be eradicated from my life. But, but sin looks so pleasing. And, and I would say this, it's supposed to. That's how sin works. Now, some of you have been delivered from your sin and you look back on your sin and it's grotesque. It no longer has the allure from what it, does, what, what it once had. You, you were delivered from it. Some of you might have been saved from something, but that, that sin kind of pulls you in every once in a while. So there's still great temptation in your life. So I'm preaching to all kinds of people this morning, how, how can something so adorable cost us so much in our life? Well, I've learned this, that the allure of sin and the attractiveness of sin fronts itself very well. It looks very pleasing to the eye. It doesn't show you the destructive factors on the other side because if this showed you the destructive factors on the other side, you would not be allured or attracted to it. What happens is sin captivates you and the tentacles of sin wrap itself around you as you begin to know it more. And I don't know what your sin is. If you're sitting there thinking, does he know? Does he know? Does he know? I have no clue. But if the Holy Spirit's trying to deal with an area of your life, relent, say, God, help me with this. Help me to walk with you. Sin, to, sin will, will lead somebody down a, a path that feels good because it fills a, a fleshly desire of sort in our life. But it does not reveal, it doesn't reveal where it will spit you out on the other side. Sin in its attractive form has no shame to it. None. You're not thinking shame, you're thinking flesh. Sin has, has no, when you start, it has no guilt associated with it. When you sin, you, if you had any guilt, you bypassed all that stuff over time. 
Some of you have been there before. All of a sudden, you were walking in this direction. You were tempted by something. It had not been an issue in your life. And all of a sudden, you look at it, and you start walking in that direction. Holy Spirit arrests you. You're strong enough in the Spirit right now. You start walking the other way. You start going on in your day. It might be a year later. All of a sudden, issue comes up again. And, and, and you start walking in the direction of it. You just look a little bit longer. And, and, and you walk away from it because the power of God is working on the inside of you. You're living a disciple life. You've been praying. You've been reading the word of God. You said, Lord, I know that, that, that I, have, I have been built up in you. Your word says that I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin. But you keep keeping back to it. You keep walking back to it until you begin to give in to the process of temptation. Sin does not show you at the start the guilt, the shame, Sin does not show you the sleepless nights. Sin does not show you the miserable days. Does it, church? No, it doesn't because you would run away from it. It doesn't show you that in the end, it will leave you empty. Even the thing you thought you had, you didn't have. And that can come in so many different packages, in so many different ways. I don't want to give on the first Sunday of the month some watered-down version of something that will leave you short of God's plan for your life. I know that it might not be the most popular message to speak at the beginning of the year, but I'm just wondering what life could look like if there are any sins that are holding on. I think the book of Hebrews says besetting sins that just won't let go in our life. I wonder if we could be free of that January coming into February, what 2022 could look like. Give me a few more minutes this morning. We know that sin will destroy us. The hope would be that uh, that wouldn't happen before uh, it's too late. I think we would all agree with that. This process, let me just work through this here real quickly. This process here is, is this. When men are tempted, if we go back to the book of James, the Bible says, that they are drawn away. Somebody says, say drawn away. So the first thing that we want to look at in our life, is there anything that is drawing me away from him? This is how sin works. It's, it's God's process. Anything. Is there anything in my life, let's not look at all the major stuff, that is drawing me away from relationship that I have with him? Have I put anything else in the way and substituted that for time with the Lord? Am am I getting drawn away? Because the Bible says that we would be drawn away. James says that we would be drawn away. Everyone is tempted when he is drawn away. Drawn away means this. I, I said it just a moment ago. Drawn away means that I was walking down this path, but all of a sudden I'm drawn away to another path. Drawn away can happen very subtly. It can happen very subtly. It's just a, just a little bit of movement in the direction to the right or to the left. And over time, if I walk that path long enough, when I get way down the road, 30, 60, 90 days, I'm way off the path that I was on. You ever been drawn away from the path um, in, in, when you were out hiking? I'll tell you the scariest time in my life. We took uh, 12, I think it was 12 individuals to hike up Half Dome. It was an 87-foot climb in in Yosemite National Park. We're up at the top. We're in buddy groups. Everybody knew. They'd been trading several months for this. You'd never leave your buddy. This is your buddy. You are from the top to the bottom. You are married to your buddy. You're with them. You you watch their water. into whole, whole deal. Well, all of a sudden, we lose one person in Yosemite National Forest. We're coming down the mountain. She saw, I don't remember what it was, a little squirrel or a little bunny. She, what looked to her was a connecting trail. People were walking and talking. She thought she would just come this way and it would catch her out on the other end, but the path never led her out that way. She just kind of kept walking. It will surely, well, this is several minutes later. We have a group of people looking for someone in Yosemite National Park. Long story short, we made it to base camp with flashlights late that night, having getting everyone to the top and to the bottom. It was a good day. What was the problem? She got off the path. 
Sometimes we get off the path and it starts leading us into places that we know we shouldn't be in, but we don't self-correct. Wait, Lord, these are things that you wouldn't even really want me to see or be part of, but we just stay on that path. Surely this will somehow reconnect to the church. It would reconnect to my brothers and sisters in Christ who love me somewhere. But we get lost in the forest because we were drawn away. The second thing that I want to share with you this morning is mankind is not only drawn away, but they're drawn away by their own desires, and that's the frustrating thing. It's almost like I wish the devil could just make me do it. Because the devil made me do it. Lord, forgive me. Thank you for your grace. Every time I've sinned or you've sinned, you've done it with your own free will. So the Bible says that we're drawn away by our own desires, and, and, then, the, and then it gets worse. Our own, our, your own desire entices you. It begins to reel you in. Your, your own desire, your own desire brings you to the point of the thing you thought you would never do. Your own desire. Not the devil, not his demons, not hordes in hell. Your own desire, which you're drawn away by. So that rules out that the devil made me do it. But but then the third thing is really, really interesting because it says, remember, desire, I'm enticed, desire. It says that when desire is conceived, what does conception mean? My, my wife has conceived five times. When she conceived, it means she became pregnant. Now watch this. When desire is conceived, the seed of sin has been placed in my heart and the deed has been done. The, the, it, it, it is giving, it is, there is going to be a birth. There's going to be a birth. And when we are walking down this road where desire is conceived because we allowed the seed of temptation to grow in our heart, who would believe that we're walking down a pretty dangerous road? But it's funny because sin will talk to us like this. It's not that big of a deal. Who in the church doesn't struggle? What'd your life group say? Grace, grace, more grace. We sing about it. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will conquer. And the, we, we all, it, it will begin to work against what God is trying to say. Remember that soft, cuddly thing is a grizzly bear on the inside. And when desire that you have been enticed with conceived, the Bible says that it gives birth to sin. Listen to this. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. But, but it doesn't just say this. Sin, when it is full grown, brings death. So let me end this way. I've got a quote, and I've got a, a point. This little guy here, which is a large teddy bear, has much more destructive qualities than what we see in my analogy on stage. But here's what I want to represent. This is this grown up. It's little. It's no big deal. Nobody knows. Parents don't know. Husband doesn't know. Wife doesn't know. It's not hurting anyone. And and here's the deal. If it's sin, fine, then it just hurts me. No, it doesn't. It hurts the heart of the Father. One that created you to have relationship with him. One that created you to be in love with him, yet gave you a will. My friend, this, in the realms of sin, is simply this, little bitty areas of disobedience added up over and over and over in our life brings conception. It might even be one deal. And when that sin enters our life and it begins to grow, it might start off small, but the Bible says when it is full grown, it brings death. 
I love, and, and I, I do not make this the word of God. I would never make it the word of God, but I very much appreciate uh, much of what he has done for the kingdom of God. This is a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon, and I want you to listen closely to this quote. No matter what your maturity is in the church, what your position is in the church, I want you to listen with pristine ears. Spurgeon said this, the only real argument against the Bible is an unholy life. When a man argues against the word of God, I love this, Follow him home and see if you cannot discover the reason of his enmity to the word of the Lord. Spurgeon says it lies in some sort of sin. When you are upset with the word, and it could be, it could be, and I'm not saying preachers can't preach it wrong. It could be somebody said something and it just, I mean, it just sets you off. I can't believe the pastor said that. That's not in the Bible. Well, that's a problem if it's not in the Bible. But I'm going to read this again. I'm going to read this again. The only real argument against the Bible, so we're just the Bible, not the pastor, the Bible. The only real argument against the Bible is an unholy life. Spurgeon says that's why we argue it. When a man argues against the word of God, follow him home and see if you cannot discover the reason of his enmity to the word of the Lord. It lies in some sort of sin, which is downplaying what God said was not right. And, and I have to arrive at the scripture. Romans 6.23 reminds us that every sin has a wage. Remember, this is the month of sin and salvation. So we're going to deal with both. For the wages of sin is what, church? Death. There's a comma there. We'll get to the other. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. But I want that beginning passage to stick out. The wages of death kill a man. Spiritually. And God offers this wonderful, wonderful gift. <clears throat> First Sunday of the month... 2022 take the journey not hardly that could that could that could actually be your response to discipleship this year not hardly not me man you're not gonna find me doing any of that stuff i'm cool i can you might even say i can do all of this stuff without all of you all here's the problem it's not bible because you need me and i need you what we wanted to do is we wanted not only to teach and to preach and, and let you take these things and, and run with them and study them, and we've got a way in which you could do that, but we also wanted to give you a challenge every month. So I'm issuing 12 challenges from this platform. These challenges are not only created by me, but a group of people that are praying and interceding for the heart of God for this church for 2022, and this is challenge one for January for the entire month. We are asking if you would be willing to re, uh, memorize James 1, 14 and 15. Do we have that verse back there, James, right here? Can you read it with me really quickly? This is, this is the, whole, the whole part. Um, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away with his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings to death. We're asking every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. I would say if your kid can talk, teach him this verse. But in the month of James or in the month of January, we're going to memorize this verse so that the pattern is embedded in our heart. Wait, I'm getting tempted. I'm getting pulled away. Wait, this is my own desire that's getting me on, off track. I'm getting enticed by my own desire. This is ridiculous. God, I got to get this to you. You got to help me with this. And then the second thing is, it's a two-part challenge. So it's to memorize this first. And then I think, you have another slide back there, James. The second part of January challenge for all of us, starting with the pastor, is to search your heart for sin that needs to be submitted to God, asking him for help and forgiveness. This is all of us. I am going to this week start searching my heart for sin that needs to be submitted to God, asking him for help and forgiveness. Be open to say, God, am I hiding anything from you? Bring it to the forefront. So the two things are to memorize that verse 
and then do this heart search with us. We'll be bringing that up all throughout January. The other thing that I want to remind you of is we have books as you're exiting today. Um, this is going to be the only week right now of homework that you have, I believe, first quarter. And we are going to be studying out um, in the first lesson. It's called The Original Story. So it's just a few pages that you have to read. It is loaded with scripture for you to read and give an answer to based on your perspective. I'm asking everyone that is going to start this journey with us between now and next Sunday. Love for you to do it on Wednesday evening to get in that pattern. But to go ahead and work through lesson one, you'll see it. It's got lesson one. And you're just going to work through all of that. What will happen on Wednesday nights as we progress and move forward, starting, I believe it's Wednesday the 12th, the, the second Wednesday of the month, we will be coming together. We'll be sitting all over the room. We'll have a facilitator. We'll have uh, things going on for the youth who will be working through this. The kids, we will be discipling them as well. There's some, some curriculum and some things. But we're asking you to take the journey with us. We're asking you to take a book today and work through lesson one. Dads, I would love it if you'd call all your family together, together this week just as a kind of a, a, a prime the pump to get this started and say, hey, we're all gonna go through this together. And, and I know it might be, hey, get back to the table. I get all that. But just start working through it. The second Wednesday, we will all come together here in this building. We'll divide up into some groups. And um, it's gonna be a year of discipleship, taking a journey that uh, is not gonna be easy and it could have some pain in it. But I promise this, if we will deal with the initial pain, God has a whole nother bucket of fruit of righteousness on the other side to give everyone who has been trained by it. Would you stand with me as we pray this morning? If, if there's anyone today that would be watching on the line and you would say, Pastor Brian, I'm just, I know I'm not right with God. You have, a, you have a way there in your technology to private message me. Just throw it on the... On the, uh, on the Facebook there and, and I will reach out to you this week because I want to pray with you. Um, if you're here this morning and it's like, you know what, kind of starting the new year, new year, Pastor Brian, I think I just need to get things right with the Lord. So while heads are bowed, eyes are closed, is there anyone standing in the sanctuary right now that would say, I really think I need to start the year off right? I need to